Alison, uh, Alison Summers and Megan Radovich from the Zanta International Headquarters. Zant, the NAIDM committee, uh, committee and USA governors, my colleagues here, um, Zanchans from all over the US and distinguished guests. My name is Sarojini Rao, and it is my pleasure to invite, uh, welcome you all to the, the fair, uh, the great state of Ohio and the fair city of Cincinnati. When the class of 2020, 2022 uh, governors met in Chicago with the then president elect Sharon and the headquarters in February of 2020, little did we know that within a month, within a month, our life as we knew it would change forever because of the pandemic, the worst pandemic in recent history. But thanks to the scientists at Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson and Johnson, AstraZeneca, and many other small uh, places, they developed a vaccine that has enabled us to be here today at NAIDM in Cincinnati. I hope you are all having a wonderful time attending the various sessions that the committee has planned for us and also building uh, enjoying the camaraderie and building friendships here in today. And I hope you have taken the time to visit some of the sites in Cincinnati that I think was in the brochure. So again, welcome, and I hope you have a good time today. Now I am going to, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Um, Catherine Sullivan. I had, I had, the, I had the, ple uh, the pleasure of attending the meeting and hearing her in uh, uh, the Zanta Club of Columbus meeting in January. And little did I know that I would be introducing her today. And so in preparation for this introduction, I did what probably many of you would have done, gone to the internet. And oh my, if I have to list every one of her achievements, her recognitions and her awards, it would take me at least 20 minutes, but Joyce, the chairman, gave me only 10. And of which I think I have already spent about three minutes, maybe. So I have to talk fast and be kind of brief. And if you want to know more about Dr. Sullivan, you go to the internet and you find out. So Dr. Sullivan has had a long career as a distinguished scientist, astronaut, and an executive. She earned her bachelor's of degree, bachelor of degree in earth sciences from the University of uh, California at Santa Cruz in 1973, and received her PhD in geology from Dalhousie University at Nova Scotia in 1978. 
Soon after her graduation in 1978, she joined NASA as one of the six women in their astronaut corps. As a crew member of the space shuttle mission, she uh, was one of the first American women to walk in space on October 11, 1984. Then she received an invitation from Victor Vascovo, who is a naval officer, to take part in a sub submersible dive and challenger dive, the deepest known part of the Earth's bed in Mariana Trench, which she accomplished on June 7, 2020. So, this made her the first person to orbit the Earth and reach its deepest point in the ocean. In addition, she was also recognized as the many firsts. She was recognized by the Time Magazine and was on the list of the BBC as 100 women. This was announced in 2020. She has held many se uh, senior executive positions. Oops. <laughs> that was not part of my script. <laughs> and served on many, many boards and has received many recognitions awards since leaving NASA. Here are a few items that I chose that would be of interest to you all. She was designated in 2017 as the Charles Lindbergh Chairperson Chair of Aerospace History at the Smithsonian Institute uh, National Air and Space Museum. After serving the chief scientist, deputy administrator and administration of National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Administration. For bird enthusiasts, she sits on the board of the National Audubon Society and also on the board of Accenture. She's a member of the National Ac Academy of Engineers for all engineers in this group. That might be of interest to you. She has a, an astronaut, aviators and veterans, please take note. She has been inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame, Women's Aviator Hall of Fame, Women's Diver Hall of Fame, and Ohio Veterans Hall of Fame. And for all the future young scientists, young women and young men. She's also the author of a book um, called titled To the Stars, was published by Charles Burke Press in 2016. She now lives in Columbus, Ohio, a Zonta prospect, No pressure, Dr. Sullivan. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Catherine Sullivan. Don't go away. Don't come out here. <laughs> Thank 
they shouldn't do this until they know if they're happy with my talk. <laughs> Wait, wait, but wait, a grand distinction has been earned here tonight by your governor. I have been doing more public speaking than you would care to count since I was 26 years old. And one of the preparatory steps I always have to do is instruct the introducer how to pronounce the name of the university where I earned my PhD. And so I said to Sarojini at the table, are you going to mention that university? And she said, oh yes, Dalhousie University. First person ever, your governor. <laughs> so, I made this title up, it might or might not have something to do with what we talk about tonight. Uh, it has a few things to do with some of the slides that I have and the stories I will tell. And then we'll go to some questions and discussion together. And so the rest of that is up to you. So if my slides only get 40% of this done, that means 60% of the job is yours. No pressure, just, just so you know in advance. Um, but I have had this extraordinary privilege and opportunity uh, to explore both and work in both outer space and the deep sea. We were uh, not joking, but speaking honestly at our table that uh, I, I am all those things as Sarajini mentioned in the biography, but here's the simple way to understand this. I am living proof that toys, travel and adventure are a really good recipe for a career. <laughs> Just saying. So I'd like to start with a little historical perspective and looking around the room, I think this, I hope will bracket many, many, many uh, people who are here tonight. This is obviously an artist concept of you know, a some space future, right? Uh, this appeared in a magazine called Collier's in 1952. Uh, it was drawn by an artist named Chesley Bonestell whose favorite famous for anything but principally this. Uh, and you can figure this out, right? That would be Earth, right? Blue, land, Costa Rica, got it. Uh, this is a space station, Arthur C. Clarke, right? Arthur C. Clarke actually used some of Bonnestel's art for 2001 A Space Odyssey. This is described in the article that accompanies it as a shuttle. It's been specifically designed for the particular task of going back and forth from this thing here to that thing there. Uh, and then, you know, here's something weird, right? That thing there, I always thought that part looked sort of like somebody pulled a Tylenol capsule apart, right? <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, it's got this stubby back end and it's got this girder work here. And this is described in the article in 19, wait, 1952. 1952, World War II just ended seven years before. Europe is in ruins. No one has ever put anything into space yet. The Germans had V1s and V2s. They did like, you know, a cannonball does this. The V2 did that. It's just a bigger cannonball. Uh, no one's ever done anything in space. 1952, oh, no, we're going to put a telescope up there. No clouds, no turbulence. Super, really good. And oh, by, oh, by the way, oh, by the way, we'll have people in spacesuits over here too, outside doing things. 1952, in 1952, this was the vision of Werner von Braun. That article laid out his sense of given the state of things at that time coming out of the war effort, this could be a future. I was born in 1951. So Bonnestel painted this the year I was born. It published the next year. I knew nothing about it until 1985 when we used it as the front piece for the report of a presidential commission that I was on. So imagine being, you know, 32 years, 33 years old, 30, yeah, 34 years old. And you see this painting and you know it was painted in the year you were born. And you look at it and say, 
Yeah, but wait, there is one of these now. I've actually flown in it, turned into a different shape and a different color, but the idea, right, happened. This, we've got plans on the drawing board. We've had big presidential announcements. It's gonna look different. It's gonna be like girders and trusses. It's not gonna be round and spinny, but happening. It's up there now. There's six people on it right now. It's been permanent since the year 2000. It is, it is true that not every human being has been living on planet Earth. Since, yeah, when we pick carefully who we send, but no, separate point. But imagine that first time in history of life on this planet that some of the life that originates on this planet has been living off the planet for more than two decades. Again, looks different, same idea. And this thing, when I, the day I meet this painting, this thing is the Hubble Space Telescope. I had just been assigned to the crew that was gonna deliver Hubble to orbit. I had been out to California, I had seen it. Doesn't look like that, came out different. But the ideas here, that the notion to me in my 30s, and even today, honestly, uh, that this, this is what scientists and engineers do. They conceive of things that don't exist yet and the how to make them happen. And then with support and conviction of the public or companies, they make them happen. Sometimes slower than you want, sometimes faster than you want, but this is what's so fabulously cool about scientists and engineers. So, you know, this was this house of mirrors moment for me of uh, you know, all the times and chapters of my life just kind of echoing back and forth and how astonishing it was to me. At 34 years old, you've lived, you've lived what? You've lived roughly a third of the lifespan of a well-to-do human being. I earned my PhD at 26, I'm 35 now. I'm, I'm a third of the way in, <laughs> I'm a, well, not now, but <laughs> a little older, a little older. But I mean, wait, so that sounds like a long time, 51 to 85, that's a long time. But think of it, it's a fraction of a professional life. It's a fraction of a human life. And these extraordinary things, they were, they were physically and technically impossible, totally, the day the painting was made and they've become real. And not only that, but as a little kid who sat in front of the television and watched Mercury and Gemini and Apollo with zero thought, zero thought that that was ever a path I would be on, I'm now in the picture. That happens in all of our lives in countless ways if we're watching and paying attention. So this is of course what those two bits looked like. That's the, what the Hubble looked like at that same time, 1985. This is an artist concept of the shuttle you know, delta wing and, black, and white, not black, but it's happening. And so one of the stories I've written about recently is a chapter of Hubble's history that has not been told before. The broad, typical outline of the Hubble history is kind of th three chapters with an exclamation point in it. Chapter one is, oh my God, it took forever to get through all the bureaucratic and budget crap and get it built. Chapter two is, uh, look at all the cool astronomy it's done. And the puncture, the exclamation point in the middle is, oh crap, it can't see straight. Thank heavens they fixed it. Huh? Well, I was part of the team, hello. Um, I was on team Hubble from 1985 until it was put in orbit in 1990. And the, this is the hinge point of the Hubble history because it had been imagined since the middle 60s that we'd put this big telescope up and like a telescope on the top of a mountain, right? It, it continues to be useful for decades and decades because you can drive a new camera up, you can change the equipment, you can fix things. It's just on the top of the mountain. We need to be able to do the same thing, even though this one's gonna be above the earth. Mid 1960s, there's been like four spacewalks ever in the history of humankind. Two of them almost killed the astronaut. But again, here's engineers saying, yeah, that's all right. Well, you know, Michelin repairman, orbit, telescope, school bus size telescope, fine scale electronics, yeah, no problem. Folks in spacesuits will go do that. 
But the problem was when we were assigned to work on Hubble in 1985, basically none of the tools and equipment needed to deliver on that process, on that promise, had been built. Some of them had not even been designed. And so Hubble in the real world looks like this. Look, notice these little dots over here. Those are human beings. That's how big Hubble is. School bus size, about 15,000 pounds. Uh, and the engineers that started imagining Hubble in the earliest days in those mid 60, early 70 timeframes, they had the foresight to think about making it modular, putting the things you might need to replace or repair outside, basically in kitchen cabinets wrapped around the outside. Uh, you, if you need to maintain something, you don't want to have to remove four things that are still working to get at the one thing that's broke because they might not be working when you put them back in. Uh, so they had that kind of foresight, but then you still need wrenches. And you know, if you're an astronaut spacewalking, you need someplace to anchor your feet so that when you turn that wrench, the bolt turns. Because if you don't anchor your feet and you turn the wrench, you're turning it. <laughs> the, the bolt just laughs at you, right? So this was the essence of the work that uh, Bruce McCandless and I, on behalf of the Astronaut Corps and a slew of engineers did from 1985 to 1990 is let's, we need to know, we have every tool and every piece of equipment. We need to know positively each tool fits on every single place it ought to fit. We're gonna prove that. NASA had had three near misses of trying to fix things in orbit without prior planning and some tool didn't fit. So our motto was, you cannot have an astronaut at the Hubble Space Telescope who says, hey guys, the wrench doesn't fit. Yeah. Or who says, uh, I can't reach this. And the reason, real reason I wrote the book, it's partly a memoir of my own story, but these guys here are the real reason I wrote the book because they are, they are to Hubble what Katherine Johnson and the other women in Hidden Figures are to Mercury. These are people whose works, Hubble is operating today. It is still producing science today. It was promised to operate and be a good observatory for 15 years. It's been doing that for 31 years. And it's about a thousand times better telescope today than when we put it in orbit, just like your cell phone is a hundred times better than it was a few years ago, because you could take the new technology up and keep it fresh and at the cutting edge. And that's these guys whose stories had never been told before. So I wanted to write my story as a vehicle for bringing vignettes of their stories to the fore. So besides the gadgets, you need to be sure you know what the choreography needs to be to do the repairs. You simulate spacewalking by working underwater uh, in, in actual spacesuits, ones that are never gonna fly in space, ones that have been devoted to training underwater. So here's a full size Hubble. Uh, that's me, that's Bruce McCandless. Here we're practicing moving a refrigerator sized box that in the real world would weigh five or 600 pounds. You can move it with your bare hands in zero gravity, but can you, it, it, it's an instrument on the telescope. So when you slot it in there, it needs to be aligned to within two thousandths of an inch. So can you get it in there? Can you reach everything? Can you see it? Do you need your buddy to be over there to help you see it and not bump things? All of that sort of question and work we would sort out in the water tanks with ever more refined levels of detail from one test to another. Um, they got a lot of the thinking ahead about maintenance right on Hubble, but there's a lot of complicated electronics boxes with big you know, connectors that are close together uh, and a space suited gloved hand is never gonna be able to get at those and move those. So nor, nor could any set of pliers that you would buy at Ace Hardware do this. Besides, I mean, starting with the fact that just you at least need to change the handle so that your big oven mitt hand can work with that wrench, but then odd angles and high forces. So here's one of the tools we had to invent. Uh, this, is a, this is a Mark I standard ratchet wrench modified for fat spacesuit hands and with lots of extra lengths of extension and with gadgets in them that make sure that you can't yank on that bolt too hard and, and wreck it. And again, here's, uh, here's Bruce McCandless and that's me on the real telescope. So the other thing we did was every one of those tools we are taking to the real telescope 
checking on every fitting. We are the last two astronauts that will have the real telescope on Earth at hand to prove this stuff works. We can't let any of the near misses happen with Hubble that had happened in the mid 80s with other sp spacecraft. Uh, this is April 24th, 1990. Uh, this is H Hubble, obviously. This is the Space Shuttle Discovery, the robotic arm that has lifted Hubble out of its bay and, and held it in place while the ground guys made sure everything was working. This looks like this nice, simple still photo, right? This is a 200,000 pound space shuttle that's moving at 17,500 miles an hour. This is a 50,000 pound telescope that is also moving at 17,500 miles an hour. They, right in this scene, they are flying in, in very close formation about 10 inches apart at 17,500 miles an hour. Bruce and I, having only worked, for this, on, worked on this moment for five years, we are not pasted into these windows watching it because this solar array did not unfurl as it was supposed to when time was very critical. And so Bruce and I have jumped into our spacesuits. We've gotten to the airlock. We've dumped half the air out. We're one step away from opening this little door, going outside so I can crank that solar array out by hand. And some goofball engineer on the ground figured out that he could fix it with software. And so Bruce and I are staring at the sterile white wall of the airlock while this dramatic moment happens. So there you go. Life in the big leagues. So you know, we are thrilled. This is a huge success. We're waiting for this first light image. Uh, we had only halfway joked as a crew that we were going to take every astronomy, astronomy textbook we had from our undergraduate years, and we were going to burn them because Hubble was going to turn those all upside down so quickly. And then, of course, it turns out it couldn't see straight. That blurry vision. The mirror that makes Hubble work is about the diameter of each of your dinner tables. And it's supposed to be concave, right? So that the light comes to a focal point. It was slightly too flat. How slight is slight? Pluck a hair out of your head, cut it into 25 slices, one twenty-fifth of a human hair. Which is like, for us, right? It's like, sure, yeah, who? In astronomy world, that's like a massive error. And you can see the kind of, you know, trash talking that we got, NASA got for a long time, right? I love this quote, like a, you know, like an eagle turned, you promised me an eagle, you delivered a bat. I mean, come on. Uh, maligned on the cover of Newsweek. Anybody see Naked Goat in two and a half? Yeah, there's this sort of loser's cafe scene with like the Ed Soul and you know everything that's ever been in engineering, the Hubble is right there. I mean, it was, you know, the knife, the knife was turning everywhere you went. Um, but the maintenance capability saved the day. So this is what Hubble could see at that first moment with the bad mirror not doing what it ought to do. In uh, 1993, a crew went up with the tools and equipment that these engineers we worked with had built. They took out one of those refrigerator sized boxes. They put another one back in its place that had you know, eyeglasses essentially. Uh, Hubble actually uses mirrors instead of lenses, but the same principle like your optician does. Because the, ba the bad news was we really screwed up. The good news was you screwed up very precisely. And so you can actually make a precise mathematical calculation, just like your eye doctor, of what would reach Hubble's site. And you see here the immediate after repair image, which is right at the level Hubble should be able to do. I could, if I went and found you an image of that galaxy today with the current camera that took it, it's at least, it's hundreds of times better. And oh, by the way, Oh, by the way, President Sharon was working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This is called, oh, it's better. Oh, it's better. Oh, it's better. The instrument that took this is called the Wide Field Planetary Camera. It was built at Caltech and Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So was the replacement. And guess who was the lead mechanical engineer when all that was happening? <laughs>
So there's a Hubble image current. So this is the, oh my God, oh thank heavens, holy cow. Okay, going the other direction. My, my friends have a really simple description for me. This is just a woman who has extreme ups and downs and it's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, very, it's very apt. Um, so here's a really strange. So all the brown is basically the mud on what would be the 20,000 foot bottom of the ocean. And all these little blue bits that are left are what's called the Hadal zone, named after Hades, the deep. So deeper than 6,000 meters, basically deeper than 20,000 feet. And you notice, you know, this is the Aleutian Trench along Alaska, the Kamchatka Trench, the Japan Trench. This is the segment of the trench that produced that horrific earthquake and tsunami in 2011, um, the Tonga Kermadec Trench. There's a trench in the, where is it? South Sandwich Sea here between South America and Antarctica. Five major ocean basins around the world and each of them at the rim has one of these trenches with this super deep water. Uh, this is the, get, myself, get me oriented here. Uh, this is the Marianas Trench, this little bit here. And the deepest known point, pretty confidently now, the deepest point period in the world's ocean is right at that end of that trench. So there's this guy named Victor Vescovo, who uh, Sarogini mentioned. He's an equity investor based in Dallas and quite an adventurer. He's uh, summited the highest mountain on each of the seven continents. He's skied across the North and South Pole. So he, that earns him the Explorer's Grand Slam. And somewhere in the course of that, because he's this super smart guy and very polymath guy, somewhere in the course of that, he thinks, any place that has highs has lows. So we have this huge big thing about seven summits. How come there's not some challenge to reach the however many it would be deeps? How, would it, how many would it be, by the way? And he starts researching this and discovers, well, it would be five deeps in the five deep oceans. And there's reasons this is not a thing. Number one is actually no one knows for sure where they are. So, you know, we know, you know, I can, I can tell you the deepest place in the Southern Ocean is gonna be somewhere in that little blue arc there, but that's a thousand miles long. So where in that thousand miles is the deepest place? Don't know. In fact, no one's ever mapped that one at all. And the second thing is no vehicle exists that can take people that deep. If when you go underwater, if you if this was the surface of the water, the ceiling in this room, and you went down as far as just the floor, you'd be under twice as much pressure as you're under here. Every 10 meters, every 33 feet, double the atmospheric pressure. If you go to the deepest point in the ocean, it's 11 kilometers down, it's 1100 times more pressure squeezing in at you from every angle. Big number, hard to understand. Hippopotamus on a single stiletto heel, standing on every square inch of the outside of your submarine. 16,000 pounds per square inch, like also known as a lot. Um, <laughs> so Victor doesn't just discover, well, there's five, but no one knows. And uh, Victor then says, well, so couldn't be found out? And is it like not possible to build something that can go there? Uh, and so he finds this ship on surplus, former Navy and former NOAA ship, and learns what, what kind of mapping gear would it need to go to all those little blue bits and confirm where's the actual deepest place, put that, put that sonar rig on there. And he goes to a company that usually builds, usually builds comfortable, luxurious passenger submarines for super yachts that maybe go three or 5,000 feet down, Triton submersibles, and says, hey, can you guys do 36,000 feet? <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> and in the end, they create this vehicle here, 
called The Limiting Factor. Vic Victor's a fan of the Ian Banks science fiction series, so all of the gadgets he has created to do this deep exploration have names from that science fiction saga, which I'm not into, so I can't tell you more about it. Um, so again, here we are. Here's the Marianas Trench. There's that Challenger deep bit. Sense of scale. Who knows, who really has a visceral feel for what 11 kilometers is? Like, not me, right? This is the Marianas Trench. Uh, if you could put Everest in it, you'd still have a mile of water above Everest. And the next time any of you get in a jetliner and fly like a cross country distance, you will, you will be, the height you are above the ground will be still slightly less than the depth of the trench below the water. You'll be flying typically at 35, rarely 37,000 feet, usually 35,000 feet. And Challenger Deep is much closer to 36,000 feet. And so uh, in fall of 2019, out of the blue, I, so, so Victor answered that question, where are the five deeps and why doesn't anybody go there? He answered that in 2019. I have the ship, I have the sonar, I have the submersible, I'm gonna go map them, I'm gonna go find them and I'm going to them. So he completed the five deeps expedition in 2019. He also built a significant scientific enterprise around it. So this is not just golly gee whiz, I get to go do something fun. Uh, and he decided he was gonna carry on in 2020, continuing some of the deep dives, but really elevating the science missions. So his theme for the 2020 dives was to go back to some of these deeps and take some notable people whose presence would help draw attention to the ocean. He took His Serene Highness Albert of Monaco to the deepest point in the Mediterranean, for example. And in the fall of 2019, I get this email inviting me to go with him to the Challenger Deep because he figured it's about time for real scientist. And by the way, how come everyone doing this is male? And, and I kept asking around and people said it ought to be her. So, so you know, just proof that serendipity uh, really works. And so during the pandemic, June of last year, with all the protocols and testing and great, great care, uh, we made our way out to Guam, boarded the ship, went out to the Challenger Deep. Uh, this is that submersible in the water. It's, you know, it's basically shaped like a, like a pillow. It's probably my best description. It's probably about eight, I'd say close to 20 feet that direction, 12 feet that direction. The business part, if you're gonna do this, the part you care about is what you see in this little blister here. Inside that little blister that looks like staring eyes face, there is a titanium ball, a hollow titanium ball. It's five feet in diameter. It, the walls are three and a half inches thick, and that's what it takes to withstand all the hippopotamuses that are standing on the outside when you're down at 11 kilometers. Uh, viewports, a manipulator arm, if you find something you want to grab, you can pick it up and bring it back up. Lights, all these square things are lights. You get below about 700 feet in the ocean, there are no photons. If you want to see anything, you need to have brought the photons with you as lights. And so down we went, and you are now on the bottom of the Marianas Trench, uh, fly about five feet above, above the bottom, kind of looks like a moonscape. You notice how nubbly it is? As an oceanographer that tells me this is, a, we would call it a busy bottom. That means there are worms and invertebrates living on and in the upper few centimeters of the sediment. So it is not a lifeless place. Up, up until sometime in the 1900s, it was believed that there, there was no life below a certain depth in the ocean. Uh, absolutely not true. There is life everywhere. It's sparser because uh, the food supply is very low, but there are all sorts of interesting life forms. I think we can, can we run that once please again? Would you reloop that? There you go. So you see these little nubbles, little sea cucumbers, you, you can see a little sort of shaping here. There's a bit of current, even at this incredible depth, there's a little bit of current. And the word that kept coming to my mind, because I got to be just a passenger on this, I had this horrifically hard job. Sit still, don't pee, be curious and be good company. Right up my alley. 
So I actually got to look out the window. I did not have to be monitoring things and flying things, which was a wonderful thing to do. Uh, and it was just, I just kept thinking moonscape. I kept thinking of all the stories I ever heard Buzz and Neil tell me about you know, cruising into their landing place on the moon. It, it's tan instead of gray, but it struck me as this has got to be what that was. This is the closest thing I'll ever see to a moonscape. Uh, so here's Victor uh, and me in the sub. You can tell we're still on our way down. It gets colder and colder, of course. So we brought down booties and ski caps and things. There are heat. There are heaters in the submersible, but if you spend electrons on the heater, that's instead of lights to see things and instead of propellers to move around on. So you know this is why God made down so we can just clothe ourselves and spend the electrons on the other stuff. Uh, this is a picture I took out my viewport as we landed, as we rendezvoused with one of these robotic automated scientific packages. So besides us going down for the fun, we put three of these robotic packages down on every mission, make more measurements, get more data, take water samples. There is so little known about these deepest parts of the ocean that every little ounce of data is just about, it's a revelation. Uh, and the minute you See there's the manipulator arm. Now we did not see on any of our dives any actually moving living critters other than those ones that were bubbling along the bottom. But when we put one of those one day we put one of the robotic landers down, and it woke someone up who had been sleeping happily. And so watch this little guy here. He had the good grace to swim up right through the camera view. And I want you to notice a couple things. The way it's moving is whole body undulation. It's got these fine little cilia or fibers. Those are probably feeding tentacles. As it gets up to around here, it's, you know, it looks white here. You'll see it's translucent. You can see through it. And this yellow thing is actually its guts and intestines. So that's a, it's called a polychaete, or we would call it a bristle worm. That's the common kind of thing you will see at these depths. Fish, the deepest a fish has ever been seen is about a mile and a half shallower than this, two kilometers shallower than this, or any large octopus. So invertebrates, you know, bendy bodies, which is really good if there's that much pressure around there. Why would they be white or transparent or translucent? There's no photons here, there's no light here. Color is no advantage, not for mating, not for protection, not for anything. Don't spend energy making pigment when there's no reason. And Yay! What do you, so it's four hours down, by the way, that this is a complete contrast to a space flight. A space flight is eight minutes on top of a bomb to get to orbit. Seven million pounds of thrust. This is like 500 pounds of ballast to turn you into an absolutely smooth elevator. It's a four hour elevator ride down. You noodle around on the bottom and it's a four hour elevator ride up. What do you, what do, you do in the four hours? We chit chatted and got more acquainted on the way down. And we watched, and we ate our lunch at 33,000 feet below sea level. So we would not be busy with our sandwiches on the bottom. Uh, and we watched a movie on the way back up because who doesn't? <laughs> So my, second only to how do you go to the bathroom in space, the question I am most commonly asked is, you've done sea in space, which did you like best, which did you prefer? And of course, my answer is I prefer the fact that I didn't have to pick, I got to do them both. But the thing I love most about both of them is, is this. This is 298% team sport. I have been the extraordinarily lucky person that got to put on the blue overall and go be at the pointy end and have these extraordinary experiences. Uh, but every one of these people owns my, every one of my space flights to exactly the same degree that I own them, totally. And this is our crew sailing back into Guam after our dives. Uh, when it comes to you know, a, a patch or a pin that signifies that mission, they, these are all Olympians in that sense, right? I medaled. I was the lucky one who got to do the race and medal. These are all Olympians. That's what it takes to make these sorts of things happen. And I gotta tell you, if you ever have the chance 
doesn't have to be on this scale, 70,500 miles an hour, 36,000 feet. If you ever have a chance, and I know you do, what I'm about to say is true of this event here right now tonight. You have the chance to be a part of a team that makes something happen that is bigger than yourself and reaches a higher purpose, you are blessed. It is the most extraordinary opportunity. And, and this is maybe a bit overwrought, but I offer it to you and I encourage you to offer it to young people that you talk about. What I just said, what you just applauded and what I know you know, help young people in this saturated social media, celebrity influencer age, help them really understand and believe. It has nothing to do with font size. It has nothing to do with likes. It has nothing to do with whether it, it, what, by the value and purpose and worth to you has nothing to do with that. You know, help them understand that. So I hope you will all come explore more with me in the, uh, this is my pandemic project, launching a podcast so I can continue exploring. And you know, I'm not the only one who has cool stories that offer insights on the challenge, the fun and, and interesting ways to navigate lives. Uh, I've talked already to Bill Nye, the science guy on one end and a 21 year old freshly graduate, freshly graduated college student who, at 21, having just finished college, has already written and produced two off-Broadway shows and created a on, totally online digital universe that people have described as the Marvel universe with musicals. It, it rivals anything JK Rowling has done. And, and that's actually not what she wants to do for a career. She wants to go into social and criminal justice. Fascinating young woman at 21 has countless things to teach all of us. So exploring the world through the eyes and the life story of someone like Morgan Smith. I have fun, I get to learn things and hopefully offer mentoring kind of stories to many, many more people than I could ever reach in person. So Kim and Sharon Sarajini, uh, thank you for hosting me here today. And it's been a delight. Thank you. Dr. Sullivan, thank you very much for that very, very educational, I think, is the best word I can use at this point. Thank you again. My pleasure. <laughs> oh, wait, did anybody have? We can do questions if you want. Yeah. Um, so the fitness, the fitness routine to do the dive was you know, absolutely minimal. You just have to be agile enough to clamber into the sub, uh, which is not that hard. Uh, but you know, in, in my astronaut days, I mean, we were we basically were all classified medically as you know, elite athletes and had the kind of medical ID and treatment regimes that go with that. Uh, back then, at least, NASA was very unspecific about what you ought to do. It, they kind of said, we spent a lot of time and money to find smart people. Fitness is part of the job. Don't prove us we were wrong. <laughs> Anybody else? I'd be happy to take more. Yes. I, I did just the one dive. Uh, on that expedition, 10-day uh, expedition, we did three dives. And, and thank you, because reminds me of a detail that's astonishing that I didn't mention. 1960, two men in a blimp called the Trieste go to the Challenger Deep and back. The blimp is damaged just badly enough. It's called Trieste. She never does a big deep dive again. 53 years later, film producer Jim Cameron in a custom-built single-person sub goes down again. It was also damaged enough. It never did another deep dive. 
So between number one and number two, it took 53 years. What's really radical about what Victor Vescovo has designed is a repeatable, reliable system. And so on our expedition and four times since, Victor and his team have done three dives to Challenger Deep within seven days. If you flip that to the space, you know, how radical a change in capability is that? Flip it to the space arena, think about what we can do in space today, and say somebody comes along and creates the capability to do a mission to the moon every week. It's that kind of radical change. And he does continue, you, we were out for C, three legs in a row, three weeks. Victor then, and he's self-funding all of this, by the way, he then self-funded for the ship and a scientific party to do six more weeks of science in the trenches. Uh, it's just an extraordinary contribution to understanding our oceans. I have two questions for you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, so what is your opinion of Bezos and Virgin Atlantic trying to get to space and the future of this kind of endeavor? Second one, I'm a scientist myself and I wonder to what extent science is going to be the end of the world. Like I'm thinking if all of these crafts are going to space and the pollution that we're going to build and all that stuff, basically. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure I quite heard your second question right, but I the think The second it was, question was basically, what's the limit of science? I, I think there are limits to, uh, in the degree to which science can overcome the momentum and foolishness of humanity. But there was the atom If bomb. there's an end to the earth, it will not because, be because of science. <laughs> well, the atom bomb nearly got us there. Say again? The atom bomb nearly got us there. Yeah, but we've got you know, 7 billion people doing a lot more than a few atomic weapons have done. Uh, so that would be my bet. Um, SpaceX, uh, Virgin Galactic, Jeff Bezos, uh, they, they are making progress on lowering the cost of taking things to low Earth orbit. And you know, think back to the computer era when a computer would have filled this stage and cost billions of dollars. And the computer you have in your pocket that you use as an address book and telephone is more powerful than many of that. And it costs, what, you know, maybe $1,000. Um, so uses and benefits and prospects of what, what we can do in space, what we can learn about the Earth from space will all change radically if those costs keep coming down. My own view about tourism is I think it's a, something between a very long time and never that the tourist thing becomes something like American Airlines or United Airlines, because what, you know, what drives, it, it has to tie into something that hundreds of millions of human beings need or want at a price point. And airlines work because we need and want to be places to do things with people, family or business or whatever. Communication satellites are a very lucrative and effective commercial market because we all want to connect with each other globally. Why does, who wants to, why does someone go, want to go into orbit? So I think it's gonna be you know, a commercial climb to Mount Everest kind of adventure tourist market, I would guess essentially forever, rather than really a mass market destination. So okay. first I wanna say thank you for coming, amazing talk. Second of all, um, I've done quite a bit of traveling and I'm a scuba diver. So I understand the fascination and the excitement, but how did you manage the fear? I think I would just be, terrified to do either of these things. So were you at all scared? How did you manage it? So in, uh, in terms of thinking about applying to become an astronaut, I, I actually spent a lot of time thinking about that before I even filled out the application. Because I, you know, filling out an application in the late 70s, there's a lot of uh, controversy in the United States about whether we should have a space program or not. There's social issues or a lot of domestic issues. You know, why are we doing any of that? And so I realized, you know, if you're going to go become a part of that program, uh, it really needs to have all of your passion and commitment. You need, for me, I'm the kind of person motivationally, I need to believe in what I'm doing. I need to believe in a purpose and value to it. So do you, Kathy, see one there that you believe in. And I'd grown up in a flying and aerospace family. So I also knew there's no way the risks are zero. They're going to be big risks. People, it's all human beings doing things. They will make errors of omission and commission. So there's going to be some residual risk, hard to quantify. 
And in your own mind, that's going to be worth what you see the upside is, whether it's value to humankind or to your country or your own pride or whatever that is, you got to make sure that balances out. And I was convinced it did. And so at that point, you now have to go be part of the solution. You got to be, you know, monitoring the risks, helping mitigate the risks, fixing things as they come up in orbit. You can't go diving under a table when something goes wrong. Uh, with the submarine, submersible, I know people in the marine world. And so when Victor invited me, I, I didn't know him. I didn't know his pedigree. I didn't know any details about his sub and his operation. And so I called around to people I know who do know and asked about you know, the design and the engineering and, and the team. You're pick, basically picking up an egg, putting it in the ocean, sending it down, bringing it up, picking it up. You can, you, know, you can crack the egg just banging it on the side of the ship. Uh, and all those answers came back good. Uh, and the sub had done multiple dives and it's fully certified. It's more certified from a safety point of view than any such submersible has ever been. Uh, and the reports on the caliber of the team that were operating it came back good. Uh, and so once I, you know, intellectually, once I get that done, then my really idiotically broad curiosity takes over and it's sort of, yeah, let's go. Well, you're a real life hero and we thank you. Pardon me? You're a real life hero and we thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Hey, Catherine. Catherine, sorry, I'm in the way in the back of the room. Oh, right, yes. I am representing our virtual folks. First of all, many of them are from Canada and they say, hey, how are you? Go down. <laughs> And uh, they, they were very proud to hear you uh, talk tonight. There was a couple questions. Um, give me just a second, because I can't read this standing up. Um, do you have any concerns about humans accessing this remote and untouched world? Um, I don't, in terms of the deep sea, uh, we are all accessing that deep regime just sitting right here. Uh, if you grabbed that little worm that I showed you and brought it back up to the lab and, you know, analyzed it in the lab, five will get you 10, you'll find microplastics in it. Microplastics uh -huh. have been found in the tissues and flesh of critters in every one of the deepest parts of the ocean in all the basins. Uh, we do see some debris, physical debris at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. The most significant thing is fiber optic cable that has been jettisoned from other scientific parties. And just because you pay out 11 kilometers of cable, it's easy to let it out. It's hard to bring it back in. Um, you know, the, uh, the impact of research submersibles like these going down and back is you know, trivial in comparison to those impacts. I think the other looming impact, I would say, is the prospect of deep sea mining. We are a metal hungry society. All of us have cell phones and electronic devices that need not just copper and manganese, but other metals. And the on, known on land supplies are running very, very, very short. Uh, and enough is known about the geology of the deep seabed to know that there are you know, some pretty rich high concentration deposits of those metals, thousands and thousands of feet below the sea level. Uh, and there are mining concessions being issued uh, in various parts of the Pacific Ocean to start going after those. What we don't know, I mean, I showed you one bit of life at 36,000 feet. Uh, there's life everywhere. Uh, we are connected to all of that life. There, there are interconnections we don't even begin to understand. And we also don't have a clue yet how meaningful or significant what the train of consequences might be of disrupting those deep ecosystems. It, you know, it reminds me, you know, in the tropics, people like us would typically go move to the tropics and we think mangrove swamps, they're just swamps. I mean, it's a swamp. Who cares about a swamp? Rip out the mangroves, fill in some soil, make a hotel. And you just obliterated one of the engines that has made that coastal ecosystem work, that has generated the fish stocks, that has protected the shoreline from storms. But it just, you know, to your Western eye, to your human eye, it looked kind of useless and it would be a great place for a hotel. What are those kind of consequences we might have in the deep, deep, deep sea, because it doesn't look like a really fancy, sexy landscape to us. It just looks like there's metal there. So let's go get the metal. Okay. Um, just one more question from um, our virtual folks. 
The toll on the human body for astronauts is well known. Have you had any long-term effects to your health? I have not seen any long-term effects to my health, but my exposures were quite short. They were five, seven, 10 day exposures. Uh, if you spend months in space, you will have, or Scott Kelly a year, uh, you will have more significant differences. There seem to be shifts in, uh, uh, in epigenetics and how your, your genes respond, some genetic mutations, some impacts on your optic nerves that are very poorly understood, uh, a, a very subtle set of you know, microbiome and endo endocrine hormonal changes, most of which, as far as I've been able to follow the data, most of which seem to rebound to normal levels uh, sometime after you re return to Earth. But the, the open question is, if you went and lived in zero, if you, if you built that Arthur C. Clarke round space station, if people lived there, humans lived there an entire life, what would that mean in the long term? But on the scale of days, it's transient effects that reset pretty quickly. On the scale of months, there's some slower resets. Uh, and some, for the long duration people that have been up, there do seem to be some lingering effects in the microbiology and hormonal and, and optic nerve uh, uh, realm. Again, not mechanisms not yet well understood, treatments, if there are some not yet well understood. Thank you again. She already delivered my thumb drive so I didn't have to seal that. And you have a couple of thumb <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. That was excellent. We are so excited to hear your presentation. I think we need to give her another round of applause. Do you think? All right, now we have Mary Ann is coming up. And those people who vote, voted, you know what I mean voted, I mean bid on the silent auction, we're gonna hear who those winners are. So Marianne, here you go. Thank you for your choice. Fantastic, ladies. So as we learned this evening, Kathy is just one of the uh, amazing women that we empower through our projects and our, in our projects and um, our scholarships. And thanks to the wonderful donors of the items this evening, and thanks to you, we have raised quite a bit of money for those projects. So without further delay, uh, item one was the Amazon gift card valued at $50 of the proceeds going to the Rose Fund. And item five, which was the Coach Trifold wallet valued at $150, also going to or going to the International Service Project, went for $130 to Mary Knight. So a round of applause for Mary. So if I call your name, please stand. And Marilyn, um, a foundation ambassador, and also um, helping in the back this evening, our foundation ambassadors, Lisa and Sue. Uh, Marilyn will bring your donor form to you. It's just partially filled out with your name. I hope that I spelled it correctly. Um, my staff always gets on my case about my handwriting and I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so if I did make a mistake, please just make the correction, bear with me. Um, you will fill out the um, your donor information form. The amount is already in to make it easy for you along with the fund that it is designated to. And then you would just complete the payment portion and see Lisa and Sue up front. Mary Knight is graciously going to be the runner and will um, get the item for you um, after you complete the payment. So we are going on to item number two, which was the Lint chocolate box, chocolate basket, excuse me, valued at $60 sold for $130 to Gail Johnson. So thank you very much, Gail. Where is Gail? Right down there. Terrific. 
Okay, and the electronic Amazon gift card, which was valued at $100, was sold for $160. And I believe that went to Linda Ria. Did I get the name right? Yes. And Linda, um, I have that, so um, just see me afterwards and um, I will get that to you via an email, okay? All right, and then we had our final Amazon gift card, which was valued at $100, that sold for $175 to Sally Bean. Where's Sally? So, oh, there you are. Okay, and then we had some jewelry, which was actually made by two District 5 Zonchins, Elaine Swanson and Phyllis Decato from the Zonta Club of Ashtabula area. And they donated to District 5, our host uh, district for this silent auction. And um, as we also know, Carnelian is a semi-precious stone, the many believe to be blessed with feminine power, which gives and promotes positive life choices and the winner is was asked to wear it in good health so valued at 125 dollars sold for 200 dollars tanya walsworth will be wearing that in good health and another special collection of jewelry a cola jewelry, pink wood and bone beaded necklaces and bracelet made by Ugandan women uh, coming out of poverty, working their way out of poverty in that country, which was valued at $500, sold for $300. So that was a deal. And that went to Paige Kenzik. Is that correct? And we have a Michael Kors handbag with change purse. It's valued at $336, sold for $500. And the winning bid went to Tanya, is it Watson? Okay, awesome. And my apologies for not printing that out properly. <laughs> I took my best guess. All right, so now we get to the nitty gritty, those really interesting, fabulous um, items that people were hovering over the table for and looking over each other's shoulders and checking their bids, not once, not twice, but three times. So first we have the seven night stay in Hollywood Beach, Florida. And everyone saw the, the looping um, photos of that fabulous oceanfront property. It was valued at $2,000. And it sold for $2,600 to Pat Latona. And Pat, you'll see Karen and she'll work out all the details. All right, we come to the autographed copy memoir cookbook, Fritos Pie Stories, Recipes and More by Kalita Doolin, member of the Zonta Club of Dallas. And this was listed and valued at Priceless. It sold for $175. And the final item of the evening, should we have a drum roll, ladies? I think this really deserves a drum roll. Awesome, I'm, I'm coming to that. <laughs> That'll be the extra drum roll, the tension. Excuse me? Oh, I, I'm getting to that, I'm getting to that. Ooh, big mystery. So as we know, item number nine was the enjoy German cuisine with planning for while planning for the Hamburg convention. 
And this was valued at Priceless. Had, you saw the wonderful prizes, including the personal Langenbeck recipes that Sharon so graciously shared, along with the special VIP seats, the 15 minute um, visit, virtual visit to your club, along with the chocolates and the cookies and the um, and the book, it was valued as priceless. It sold for four thousand dollars. And the winning bid of not only the German cuisine, but there must be a food theme here too. The Fritos pie stories went to Barbie Crabtree. Where is Barbie? Oh, there she is. <laughs> okay, ladies, thank you so much to all of the donors to the foundation ambassadors who volunteered their time today, to Mary Knight, who is also running to get the items for you once you check out. Um, I will have a total for you for the silent auction and um, today's total along with any donations that you wish to make. Um, tomorrow morning, we will be accepting donations again. So I encourage you to, if you did not win the item that you were seeking, to maybe think about um, making a donation in the name of um, one of our District 5 host or steering committees, District 5 overall, or in just in honor of Kathy Sullivan, who so graciously spoke with us tonight and was so inspiring. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. All right, just a couple of announcements. Um, tomorrow morning, reminder that our workshops start at 8.30. Following the first workshop, uh, or the work, last workshop, I should say, we will be back in here in the pavilion for um, brunch at 10.15. Uh, also reminder that uh, we have a late checkout tomorrow. The hotel has granted us a late checkout at one o'clock. So that concludes tonight's program. Thank you very much.